coming right there. Hi, hey gents, welcome back to Tactical Rifleman. You know, I read all your comments and uh, we actually get a lot of questions about, uh, hey, how do I go special forces? Now, you gotta take this with a grain of salt because I'm old, I'm a fag, former action guy, and I actually went special forces quite a while ago. I actually joined the army back in 1985. That's how old I am. All right, I want that to sink in. Most of you guys were not even sperm yet, All right? So um, I always knew I wanted to be a Green Beret. And what do I mean by that was uh, a lot of high school kids don't know what they want to do with their lives. I saw the movie, The Green Berets. It's an old John Wayne movie. It came out when I was, I think, junior high school. And what I loved about it was, even though this guy was the the engineer or he was a weapons guy or he was a medic, didn't matter who it was, these guys were all very well-rounded, tactically sound. They were all awesome and willing to go above and beyond, do whatever was necessary to accomplish the mission. And that just kind of stuck with me. So I've always been blessed that I knew what I wanted to do with my life. So now, today we have the 18 X-ray program. All right. Basically, after the global war on terror, uh, Rumsfeld, Secretary, Secretary of Defense, told Special Forces to double the size of uh, the Green Beret world. Uh, you can't do that. There's just not enough people in the military. But so what they did was they started something they did back in Vietnam, where basically you could come straight off the street and go straight to being special forces. They call it the 18 X-ray program. Now that is a very, very high attrition rate, very, very high failure rate. And uh, what they found was most of the people that pass it now have got at least two years of college under their belt. Why does it matter? It matters because they're coming in much more mature. Now, Talk to the guys that are actually Green Berets with these 18 x-rays showing up at group. And even after they earn their Green Beret and they show up at a Special Forces group, they have a very, very high attrition rate. Now, they've earned the Green Beret, but they end up getting booted out of the unit because they're still not mature enough, one or two. They just don't have enough uh, actual military experience. So back when I went... Special Forces, again, this is late 80s, mid late 80s, uh, you know, when I joined the Army. Back then, you could not go straight Special Forces. You had to be a sergeant or basically a E4 promotable uh, in order to go Special Forces. Why is that? It's because when you show up at the team, yes, they may choose you to be a uh, engineer, the demolition expert, okay? Uh, they may choose you to be the medic or the combo guy, but because you could come from any background in the, in, the, in the army, yes, most were infantry, but I had guys that were mechanics. I had guys that were communication satellite imagery guys. I had guys coming from all different parts of the army. And what they brought to my A-team was, even though the guy was an engineer, because he was a diesel mechanic in the regular army we now had a guy that when our humvee broke down in the middle of the desert he had that uh that background that skill even though i was a medic uh because my previous time in the army was in a recon platoon i was a master of land navigation small unit tactics things like that i had a lot more experience doing it because i had all that time in the regular army where the weapons guy that only learned tactics in the Q course, I actually had more experience than him. So when I went, when I first joined the army, I decided I wanted to be a great Green Beret. Now I couldn't go straight to be a Green Beret. I had to start in the army. They were trying to push me to go be a, a helicopter mechanic because that's what the army was short at the time. Well, look, that's not going to help me become a good Green Beret. So I wanted to be a not just a good Green Beret, I want to be a great Green Beret. So how do I set myself up for success? I need to learn tactics. Uh, I need to be good with weapons. So I, I personally chose to go infantry first, which was a good thing because honestly, I was not ready for special forces. Uh, my, I was smart enough. My dad ran, ran the physics labs at UConn. I had 
free tuition. I was a smart cookie, but I was a juvenile delinquent. I, there's no way I would have cut it in special forces. I barely got to stay in the army, all the trouble I was getting into. So I started off with infantry. Infantry is basically basic training like everybody else, but then you do what's called AIT, Advanced Infantry Training. I learned all your infantry weapons, all the small unit tactics stuff, the saws, the M60 machine guns, the M203s, all that stuff. Um, law rockets, AT4s, but we also learn tactics. Now the tactics we were learning were uh, entry skill level one stuff, uh, shoot, move, communicate, yes, but also individual movement techniques, how to uh, IMT, uh, high, uh, high crawl, low crawl, three to five second rush, all this stuff that we take for granted now, but if you've never been showing it, you just you just don't know that stuff. Uh, my first duty station after graduating, I went to Korea. And from there, I was supposed to be in a regular infantry unit, but they came by asking for volunteers to go to the recon platoon. They said, we train harder, we do much longer hours, and nobody wanted to volunteer. I jumped at the chance, I really did. So I've actually never served any time in a infantry line company. All my time has been in a recon platoon Started recon platoon in Korea. We actually had the old Willy Jeeps back then, M60 machine guns on them. We moved over to Humvees while I was there. The Humvees were new, just coming online. But part of our recon platoon's job was to uh, use demolitions, explosives, and blow bridges while the North Koreans were coming across the border. Got to do my tours up on the uh, DMZ, designated marksmen, all that stuff. Um, so I learned a lot about demolitions. I learned a lot about sniper ops. I went to a SEER course there, put on the Air Force and first group. So I got introduced to all that stuff. Uh, helicopter ops, sling loading our vehicles and connexes underneath helicopters. I got exposed to a lot of stuff there. And because Korea was an unaccompanied tour, we trained a lot. We trained hard every day and I packed a lot of training in there. From there, I went to the 101st Airborne. Why didn't I try to go Special Forces? Honestly, I had seen so many bad sergeants in my career up to that point, and I just didn't want to be a bad sergeant. So I wanted to learn everything before that happened. So I, I got to the 101st, tried to stay in a line company, and immediately got drafted to a recon platoon in one of the infantry battalions there. Because they didn't have vehicles, uh, it was all infill by helicopter and move your little scout sniper team all over uh, everywhere we went. Uh, well, the other units would go to the field for 18 days and dig foxholes and everything. We basically maneuvered and set up hide sites and everything, 18 days at a pop, 18 days for a pop. I got to be a master of land navigation and terrain association. Went to Ranger School, obviously, because it's 101st uh, Airborne Air Assault Division. I got very familiar with helicopter operations, landing zones, everything else. I have rappelled out of helicopters, fast roped out of them, all that stuff. We did a lot of survival training, having to learn to live out of not just our rucksacks, but just what we would carry on our bodies. We would go out for days with just what we had on our individual load-bearing equipment. A lot of that uh, actually earned my expert infantryman's badge because it was what everybody had to get. Now, the funny part is uh, right after getting that, about a year later, enter Desert Storm. We go over to Desert Storm, my little scout sniper team out in the middle of the desert. Guys, I didn't shoot a single round against a bad guy there. They would insert us by helicopters before everybody else came in. And then we basically just sat in our hide sites till the, uh, till the tanks passed by us. But one thing that did happen was while I'm sitting there now, it's an air war and I'm in my mop suit, rain just coming down, my sniper hide site filled up with water. We're supposed to be guarding this road. I had a tan SUV come driving across the desert. This is right on this Saudi Iraqi border before the ground war started. And I had the upside down black V painted on the door. So I knew this was a coalition guy. He drove right up to my hide site where me and my three guys were standing there looking like wet kittens. And uh, he powered down the window and uh, 
said hello to us and he held out a, a Pepsi with ice crystals all over the outside of it. And as I'm grabbing this Pepsi, the guy's got uh, the rainbow mirrored Oakley sunglasses on. He's got a kafia wrapped around his head. He's got a red beard, very American. He's got E7 rank on his chocolate chip uh, camouflage uniform. He's a special forces guy from 5th Special Forces Group. He looked at me and he said, hey, are you from the 101st? I said, yeah, I am. And uh, he asked to see my rifle, my camouflage rifle and everything, and uh, my scope mounted on it. And uh, he said, hey, you look pretty squared away. When you get back to Fort Campbell, I want you to go special forces. And he turned around and he drove off across the desert. And I thought about it and I was like, you know, I looked at my guys and I said, it's time for me to go special forces. And I'm gonna cover that next right after YouTube slaps you in the face with one of these commercials. I'll see you back in just a minute. All right, welcome back. I hope you enjoyed that commercial as much as I did. All right, so I got back from uh, Desert Storm and uh, they pinned on my uh, combat infantryman's badge. So now I had both the expert infantryman's badge and the combat infantryman's badge. You can only wear one at a time, by the way. I went to Special Forces Assessment and Selection, uh, SFAS. I can't tell you what SFAS is like now, but what I can tell you starts with the swim test, PT test, all that stuff. First week is basically land navigation. Uh, they're just trying to push you, push you, push you. Um, you you always have your 45-pound rucksack on without water. You, you're always patrolling with your rubber duck. I had an advantage here because I was good doing cross-country navigation, terrain association. But you were allowed to walk on the roads. It's just I would save time going through the woods sometimes. But there are other times I could look at the map and know the map said that terrain was too messed up and then I would walk on the, road, on the road. Meanwhile, other guys that didn't know any better, they're like, well, instead of going all the way around, I'll just go through the woods. They got hung up in the brambles and uh, the draws. And I, a lot of times I was the first one done doing land nav. Night land nav at night, day land nav during the day. It was a cakewalk for me. Second week was what they called uh, team week where you're working together as a 12 man team. Uh, doing weird things, sand babies, you got to carry like a hundred sandbags, you and your team, you know, do you carry three on top of your ruck, one in each hand? You can do that once, work together as a group. Some guys are carrying two while I'm carrying four. You want to get pissed at them, but you got to remember, it's not about how tough you are, it's how well you can work together as a team. Smile, help each other out. Some days people have good days, some days people have bad days, but you need to be able to work together as a team. That's why they don't, call, the official name is a Operational Detachment Alpha, that team of Green Berets. We don't call it that, we call it an A-team. Teamwork is very, very important. So anyways, I end up passing selection and uh, it goes everything from a two mile run all the way up to a 25 mile road march and everything in between. And they don't tell you what your next thing is. They just say, hey, come outside with your sneakers on uh, and uh, you're gonna run. Well, how far is the run? Just do the best you can. Okay, how much time do I have? Just do the best you can. So you don't know. So a matter of fact, it bit me in the tail one time. I thought one of the other guys that was a recycle, he had already done selection once. He told me, he said, hey, this is the three mile run. Okay, so I took his word for it like an idiot. I took off running as fast as I can. I tried to break my heart. I wanted to be the first guy done and uh, turn the corner on the gravel road. Turn. I, I passed everybody except this one skinny little white guy in front of me. And I kept running, kept running past, take the next corner, the next corner. It turns out this was the seven mile run and I ended up breaking my heart. I finally saw the finish line. Never did catch that guy. To find out later on, he was on the all army track team. <laughs> but I come running and I could see Dr. Death's Suburban, the red Suburban, the medic. Saw him pulling up about 50 feet past the finish line. And as I'm running to the finish line, I started getting black around the edges. I started getting tunnel vision. And it went, boop. I blinked. When I opened my eyes, I'm laying on the ground 
and everybody's looking down at me and I had ran past the finish line, ran right into the open door of the Suburban, Nesty plunge on the ground and uh, all the instructors just laughed at me. Long story short, I passed selection and um, I wanted to be a uh, either weapons guy or engineer. They said, you're going to be a medic. I don't want to be a medic. They're like, well, you can be a medic or you can uh, go to Korea. All right, medics lead the way. So I got back to Fort Campbell and because 5th Special Forces Group is right there with the 101st, they allowed me, my unit allowed me to go to 5th Group to do OJT on the job training. When I got to 5th Group, they saw my background and I wanted to go to an A team and do all the fun stuff. And they said, you're not going to have any problem with the tactical stuff, which you're going to have problems with because I was in 11 Bravo, remember Ranger School, all that stuff. Uh, they're like, you're going to have a hard time with the medical part of it. So they made me spend six months working at Battalion Med, drawing, uh, drawing blood, doing physical exams, all kinds of stuff. Uh, hindsight being 2020, it helped me out a lot. So I moved my new wife down to San Antonio, Texas. Today, all of the medical course, all the special forces qualification courses at Fort Bragg, but at the time that I went through the first half of the medic course was in Fort Sam Houston in San Antonio. Moved my family down there. I started the first nine months. Anatomy and physiology, pharmacology, uh, trauma, veterinary skills, dental skills, lab work. We had to learn all that stuff. They actually double booked my class. You're supposed to have 99 students in the class. And instead we had 198 people show up for the course hardest PT test you ever took in your life. They redid everybody's medical records, found little, hey, here's a typo. They bumped people out. We still end up having like 150 people in my class. Um, long story short, they, tr uh, they graded us hard. And when we got through the three, trauma one, trauma two, trauma three, there was only, I think, 18 of us that ended up going uh, to Fort Bragg first time through. Everybody else recycled back either. Now, the class behind us was already full. So a lot of those people that recycled back were actually, they had to do six more months at, uh, at, at Fort San Antonio. I was one of those lucky guys that got to go straight to med lab at Fort Bragg, start records and reports and goats. Uh, my aid bags through my whole career said G-A-P-T on the outside of them. Goats are people too. You still learned all the trauma. You still learned everything else. But now you were learning it on live tissue. Uh, shooting chambers, whole nine yards. Uh, I learned a lot. Uh, from there, and there were recycles back into our class. So we had a full class, guys that had recycled at Med Lab. When... I graduated med lab, I want to say there was probably 20 of us total that went on to what's called small unit tactics. They now take people from the medic course, the weapons course, the engineer class, and uh, the commo course. The commo guys had extra time learning Morse code, brought us all together, and now we were divided up into basically a ranger school size platoon, little teams. We had to do all these small unit tactics stuff. I had already been through ranger school. I had my whole recon background. It was very easy for me. Matter of fact, some of the instructors would comment that I was a little bit too cocky. Um, we get to the final test, which they call Robin Sage. Robin Sage is done up in Uwari Forest out in the mountains of North Carolina. It is a part where they have been doing this same test all the way since the Vietnam era. A lot of those people there have been literally, uh, the families, the locals, the farmers and everything have been doing that literally generation to generation to the point to where uh, you could take Pineland dollar bills and today I could go into a gas station there, use Pineland dollars, monopoly money, buy a pack of cigarettes or a Pepsi and they'd give me a little wink as I went out the door. Great story, but I'm gonna save it for after another one of these YouTube commercials. I'll see you guys in just a minute. All right, welcome back. 
So Robin Sage, uh, take my little 12 man A team. We do mission planning there at Camp McCall at uh, back of Fort Bragg. Mission planning, what we're gonna do, our 12 man A team is going to parachute in and then we need to move cross country. We need to link up with our bundle. We need to link up with our guerrilla force. Everything's gonna be awesome. So we did, we parachute in, high fog, rain, everything. We get our bundle, we recover all of our stuff. We start moving out. Now we're having to cross electric fences, everything. This is not on any military installation, which was hilarious because my point man, a weapons guy named Ong, he was from Cambodia and he kept like, uh, me and him would take turns being point man. He would hold the branch back deliberately in the dark and then let it go and it would whack me right in the face. I hated this little guy so much that I loved him. Well, we're skirting an electric fence and uh, which he had never seen an electric fence before. You can imagine how he met his first one. So we're skirting a, a different electric fence and now it's my turn to be up on point. I actually held that branch back to whack Ong, except when I let go of it, it whacked him, threw him against the electric fence and actually held him up against it. Hilarious stuff. Ong, if you're watching, uh, I love you brother, just not that much. We actually linked up with local partisans and they tossed us up in the back of a uh, feed trailer, smuggled us across the international border and uh, we infilled through the woods and we found our gorillas that we were supposed to link up with. We sent the commander and uh, the acting team sergeant in. Again, we had a couple of captains on the team. Uh, actually, one was a major from uh, Secret Army of Virginia, Mr. Uh, ben Clark was his name. If you've ever read the uh, Tom Clancy books, uh, Ben Clark was a eye spy, was not a SEAL. He was a skinny guy with the largest mustache you've ever seen. Ben, I love you, brother. We gained rapport with the medics. Uh, we gained rapport with the gorillas. They welcomed us into their camp. This was winter time. We had freezing rain coming down. We even got snow a couple times. We had to bring them in. I had to do medical examinations on everybody. Uh, we had a couple females. We had to set up like a little uh, private areas with ponchos, uh, slit trenches. We would, uh, they would parachute in uh, supplies. We had to take them train them we would the combo guys would have to go up go off miles away to do their combo shots back via satcom and everything we ran this as though it was real guerrilla warfare with us behind enemy lines and then we started doing reconnaissance missions with them and uh, actual attacks raids ambushes and it was awesome awesome training now we would drink water out of the rivers. We would drink water. We actually drank water out of a cow pond once. We had to treat the water properly. Nobody likes using iodine tablets. We're three weeks into this and uh, here's why you need to treat your water properly. I actually came down with uh, e-histolytica, a little amoeba. Uh, so I made it through the course and actually graduation where we earned our green berets I was on all kinds of drugs to kill all these amoebas in me. At graduation, I had to actually get up twice during the ceremony uh, to go take a dump because I literally had uh, I had feces coming out both ends of me. It, it was terrible. Uh, dehydrated, IVs at night, but I made it through, earned my Green Beret. Thanks, Mom, for coming down for graduation. Enter language school because I wanted to go back to fifth special forces group so my wife could live in her hometown. I volunteered for uh, fifth group. I ended up sending me to learn Egyptian. Now, why did we learn Egyptian and started instead of modern standard Arabic? I appreciate you asking. We learned Egyptian because you got to remember uh, your Saudi dialect versus your Iraqi dialect versus your Jordanian dialect. The, the dialects of Arabic are all different. The words, for example, where one might say Iowa for yes, another one would say Nam for yes. I'm just using that as an example. But all of them understand Egyptian. Why? They understand Egyptian because that's where all of their soap operas are filmed, believe it or not. It's 
all their soap operas are filmed in Egypt. So they would consider it ghetto slang, for example, but they all understood it whether they wanted to learn it or not. So I get to 5th Special Forces group. I get put on my first A-team. I have earned my Green Beret. Now, I want you to understand that your schooling does not stop there. As soon as I got there, um, one of my first missions was to go train the Kuwaitis how to use their new M1 Abrams tank. So they sent my A-team to the M1 Abrams tank commander course. I went to NBC school, nuclear, nuclear biological chemical warfare school. I went and earned my expert field medical badge. So now I had my expert infantryman's badge, my combat infantryman's badge, and my expert field medical badge, which is hilarious because I also got my combat medic badge when uh, we invaded Afghanistan. So I had all four of them. I went to paramedic school. I went to hazmat school. I went to this school. I went to that school. I went to SODIC, Special Operations Target Interdiction Course, now called the, uh, the um, Special Forces Sniper Course, uh, which that happened to be my third or fourth sniper school up to that point. About that same time, Fifth Group started their own SIF company or CRIF company, it's called now, which is basically a hostage rescue unit. They asked, they needed a medic on the Halo team that was also uh, sniper qualified. I, they asked, hey, you want to go to Halo school in Sephardic? That's our hostage rescue school. Like, who doesn't want to do that? So I got drafted down to the SIF company, brand new company. Got to go to Halo school, another school. Got to go to Sephardic. That's our hostage rescue school. I do all kinds of back-to-back -back schools, mirror image, where you actually learn to be a terrorist so that you can think the way the bad guys do. But I went to dozens and dozens of other shooting schools. And my point of saying that is you're never done your schooling, right? Uh, towers fell, the global war on terror, and now it's real world experiences, back-to-back -back combat deployments, but even between them, you're doing more schools. But even before the towers fell, we were still deployed just as much. Uh, Green Berets are always gone. There are Green Berets in over 60 different countries today. And uh, so anyways, if you are interested in going to go be special forces, basically I got no idea how the pipeline is right now. But one thing I will tell you is, once you start schooling and you start going down that path, your schooling never ends. But what I will tell you is I do not regret it one bit. Uh, best job in the world, better than a rock star. And uh, I love it because I got to do all the fun stuff that you see in the movies. I got to play Army. And uh, more importantly, I was surrounded by some of the greatest Americans to my left and right. I consider them my brothers and uh, I wouldn't have traded a day for it. So anyways, that's all I've got for this week here on Tactical Rifleman. You know the deal. Uh, leave your comments below, and uh, I'll see you next week. Y'all take care. Shoot straight. If you like this video, make sure to like, comment, and subscribe. Also, make sure you follow us on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter so you don't miss out on anything.